right, I, I am ready to go. So welcome everyone. Hi friends. I'm so excited to welcome you all to the third science night of the fall season and the last one we will have in 2021 um, offered by the National Mag Lab in partnership with the Leon County Public Library. My name is Miss Stephanie. I'm a youth services librarian at the main library downtown in Tallahassee. Um, as you've already seen, as we've been getting ready, I have with me some scientists from the National Mag Lab, also in Tallahassee. Um, and tonight we're gonna talk about the science of food, which is perfect for me, especially because I love food, um, very food motivated. And it's just in time for all the yummy treats we'll be eating during the holidays. Um, I know you're all just as excited as I am. I'm gonna hand it off to the Mag Lab scientist, Yulia, and she's gonna introduce our other presenters for tonight. So um, thank you, Yulia. Thanks a lot, Stephanie, for having us. We're always uh, excited to come out to the library in virtual format this time. So as Stephanie said, we're from the National Mag Lab on Innovation Park in Tallahassee. And at the lab, we uh, do all kinds of things with magnets. We built them, we look into the materials for them, we do science with them. We offer the magnets to other researchers from all over the world. And that takes lots of different crafts and skills and different people to make that happen. So in this series, we bring science concepts to you, but we can also we also bring the people that do the work at the Maglab to you. And today we um, brought Martha Shakon. She is a uh, scientist in our ICR facility, and she will be talking about food. And I'm super excited for that. Also with us, we have Carlos. Carlos is our main education outreach person at the lab. And he'll be our awesome chat master this evening. So if you have any questions for Marta, if you want to share anything, if you want to answer questions, type them in the chat box. Yes. And Carlos will pull them out and share them with the group. And um, yeah, that's how we're going to take it uh, from here today. So with that, um, have fun and um, take it away, Marta. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this great invitation. So I'm so happy uh, to be here because I'm a chemist and I love chemistry and everything uh, related to food is about chemistry. So when we cook, we transform the food at the molecular level and that's just chemistry. So today we're gonna do some kitchen chemistry and we're gonna uh, learn some new concepts so you can, uh, do some experiments at home uh, when you get the chance uh, and you're gonna uh, understand some cool techniques. So, but what is molecular gastronomy? Um, okay, so molecular is related to molecules, to atoms and everything that you can see, you can touch, you can smell is made of atoms and molecules. And gastronomy is about uh, the practice of choosing and cooking and eating good food. So molecular gastronomy is the application of experimental chemistry uh, in order to make really cool and nice recipes. So uh, if we understand the chemistry and we can control it uh, in the kitchen, we can do some really nice desserts, such as for instance, a mango spear, or we can uh, do some cool things with um, vegetables and grains, like uh, doing a liquid pea spear, or perhaps like a coconut caviar or even chocolate spaghetti. So, and molecular gastronomy is when food meets science. Why? Because when we cook, we transform the food at the molecular level. So um, have you ever cooked or boiled an egg? You know that you start with this consistency and then it's transformed into a solid material. Can someone let me know why? Carlos, do you think that someone in the audience can have the answer to this question? Why, why, uh, what is the reason behind uh, this transformation? All right, boys and girls, uh, you have your question from Dr. Chacon. Martha has asked you, why does this happen? And we've got a couple answers so far. Um, heat, I've got heat a few times written in so far. Yes, heat is the responsible for one process known as protein denaturation. So this is the original shape of the molecules or the proteins that uh, comprise the eggs. 
So they have this shape, it's called a tertiary structure, and this is a protein chain, and some atoms uh, in different parts of this uh, protein chain, they can interact. And those interactions are not very strong. You can, you can destroy those interactions just by hitting them. So this protein will undergo some physical changes. They will lose this uh, like nice, beautiful shape, and they will be transformed into this irregular shape. And then they will uh, interact with each other. And in that process, they will have some water on it. And they uh, will have this solid and jelly consistency. So it's protein denaturation. So, and also when we bake, we also do chemistry. So these are some cool like uh, books that you can find and you can understand a lot of chemistry behind this process. So for instance, this is a muffin that we have made like without no using baking soda or baking powder. And when we increase the amount of baking powder, you can see that it becomes light, airy. We have some uh, cavities over here or some pockets that they have air. And I want to ask the second question. Why do you think this is happening? All right, so we've got a second question. Martha, do me a favor, repeat that second question for the crowd. So what do you think um, we create some air pockets when we add uh, baking soda or baking powder uh, to the muffin mixture and we, uh, and we do the baking process. So here we've got the muffins going from dense and the sad face, I agree, to uh -huh. light and airy and a happy face. So what is responsible for that light and airy texture by adding lots of baking powder? Um, first answer we've got written down, Martha, is air or gas bubbles. Um, second gas person, bubbles, that, that's a good one. Second person says baking soda has gas that causes it to rise. So there's another answer. Let's that's see if we can a get, good one. Let's see if we can get one more from the crowd because uh, they need a few seconds to type, I'm sure. Um, by the way, with the previous question, heat was the first thing that got typed in. Um, but then some of the later answers were talking about molecules grouping together. So they were getting more, more intricate with their answers. Oh, I got more answers. Here we go. Um, a chemical reaction. Perfect. So this is a chemical reaction. And the, the, the main thing is that baking soda or baking powder has this chemical. And when it interacts with water, it transforms into carbonic acid. And then because of the heat, it's transformed into CO2 and that's a gas. So uh, this gas is responsible for these air pockets that we can create when we do different baking processes. So for instance, this is bread and this is when uh, not enough uh, baking soda or powder is added to the mixer, but then you have this nice consistency when you add enough uh, of the chemical and it's completely safe to consume. So, but um, baking soda is not the only required ingredient for having a really nice consistency. So this is a muffin uh, that has been made using all the required ingredients. But for instance, these are the results when we don't use butter or eggs. Uh, and this is the result when we don't use the baking soda or powder. So who can tell me uh, why do you think um, this is the result when we don't add butter or eggs? Yes. All right, so we've got a true scientific experiment here with your regular, no butter, no eggs, and no baking powder. So why do we get the um, appearance that we do without butter or without eggs? And especially eggs. Yeah, I see that one. That, that one looks less, less delicious out of all of them. Yes. <laughs> You know, um, I'm going to share a story while they type in the answers. Uh, my father-in-law once tried to make us a cheesecake. And instead of grabbing the flour, he grabbed the powdered sugar. And there was no cheesecake at the end of all that baking. Um, okay, Martha, are you ready for the answers? Yes. 
Okay, first answer, because butter and eggs hold it together. Mm -hmm. Se second answer, no eggs, no fat. Um, and the third answer, because the eggs puffing it up. So all are good answers. So basically butter and eggs. Ooh, I'm, I'm sorry, Martha, I got, I got one more. Um, the eggs make the cake less dry. Also good. Um, and the, the main thing is that this is a mixture, eggs and butter are a mixture of protein and fats, and they hold together the carbohydrates that are in the floor. So you need to mix everything in the right proportions in order to have this really nice, fluffy, and airy consistency. Okay, another reaction that we see all the time in our kitchen is the Maillard reaction. And it's also known as the browning reaction is when we cook a steak and then it becomes brown. And that brownish reaction is what makes, uh, make it, uh, it stays full, like make it stay really, really delicious. So, um, and it's the reaction between proteins, sugar, and heat. And it usually happens between these temperatures. So by this reaction, we can create like browning uh, molecules molecules that cause new aromas and new flavors. So, and these are the responsible molecules for those, for, for those reactions. And here I have an example of how we can speed up that reaction. So we are going to see how you can cook uh, or you can brown onions, but we, we will have a uh, control experiment. So in which we are baking soda to one part, uh, of the reaction. Okay, so to this part, we're gonna add baking soda. And you will see how by adding baking soda, you increase the pH, which is a chemical property that will increase the production of these molecules. And these molecules cause that yellowish uh, color with a really like sweet taste. So, and you can see that uh, it's already becoming more uh, yellow compared to the control one that doesn't have uh, the baking soil. So you can, you can do also the same experiment using a steak or with other vegetables. Martha, this is fascinating. I had no idea. It's just, it's, increasing the chance of uh, getting faster the chemical reaction. So pH is one critical um, aspect in many chemical reactions. And um, by increasing the pH, you can see how you can get like more flavor and more color. That's pretty cool. I had no idea. Everyone, I learned something right now. Wow, that is so cool. Yes. So do you have any questions so far? Uh, we have not gotten any questions yet. I'm just like, my jaw's just dropping. I'm, I'm wondering like, hey, can I make bacon faster by adding baking powder to the, or baking soda to the bacon? Yes. And here is an example. So here in this, in this part of the process, in the, uh, we're making bread. In this experiment, uh, it was at a chemical that increases uh, the, P the pH uh, really high, in really high proportions. And you can see the brownish color uh, more intense compared when you add baking soda, which is uh, less uh, stronger compared uh, to uh, this chemical. And this is a control experiment in which just water was at. So you can control the color and the flavor of different um, baking uh, recipes by just controlling the pH. So, but there are other ways to manipulate uh, food and to manipulate molecules to make really fun recipes. One is called emulsification, um, another is esperification and jellification, and we're gonna study like all three of them tonight. But first, uh, let's look at emulsification. So, and I want to ask a question to the audience. What happens when we try to mix oil and water? I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask the audience anyways. What happens when you try to mix oil and water? And here come the answers already. Um, they do not collide. 
the density is an issue. I, I almost read Yulia's question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it doesn't work because water is heavier than oil. The oil yes, goes that's to why the top. it's here. The oil floats on top because oil is lighter than water. The oil is too light to go down. Great answers from everyone. Yes. They separate, they don't mix. Um, so there you go, Martha. And they don't mix because they have a different molecular structure. So this is a typical molecule for an oil, uh, an oil molecule. Uh, and it only has mainly like a long chain of carbon atoms with hydrogen. And these are non-polar. So they don't have, uh, or they are not rich in electrons. But if we compare to water, they have oxygen and they have hydrogen, and they have a lot of electrons around, them, around the oxygen atom. So they don't like to mix with these um, non-polar molecules. But we can bring them together if we uh, add to the mixture of something known as emulsifier. And an emulsifier is a molecule that has a polar head. So the polar head with, will interact with water and a non-polar tail. So, and that part of the molecule will interact with the acid, with the fatty acid or with the oil. So for instance, this is the molecular uh, structure of a typical emulsifier molecule that we can find in many uh, natural products. It's called lecithin. And you can see here a part of the molecule that has lots of uh, oxygen atoms. So it's gonna be the polar head. And this part, uh, which is carbon and hydrogen mainly, is gonna be the non-polar end. So basically, emulsifiers are like molecular hands. So they will hold together uh, at the molecular level uh, water molecule, molecules and oil molecules. Well, Martha, so, I have a question for you. Um, can you go back a couple of slides? There was a picture there I had a question about right here. Okay, the picture of the water there, um, the 2.20 and the 3.44, um, are those the electronegativity values? Yes. Yes, those are values related to, to how polar can oh, how polar can be those atoms. And the water. higher the number is, the more polar it's tending to be. And I think it goes from zero to four. Is that right? I think so. Okay, so boys and girls, the higher that number is, the more that atom is going to pull on the other things and the more polar that material is going to be. Um, more molar electrons. So it's going to be like all the electron density is going to be around this uh, oxygen atom. You're correct. It doesn't pull on the atom. It pulls on the electrons and it pulls the electrons closer. And so it creates a more polar thing. Okay. Thank you, Martha. I feel smarter now that I was like, I remember that. <laughs> Okay, and uh, we, can we can find different natural emulsifiers uh, in the kitchen. Like for instance, honey is a good natural emulsifier. Mustard, so we can find different kind of mustards. Egg yolk and soy, they have lecithin. And this is the molecule that is one of the best emulsifiers. So, and we can use it for making um, salad dressings. And here we can see a salad dressing that was not very well prepared. So you can see oil on the top separated from the uh, water on the bottom. Um, let's see how we can improve the process. So this is uh, the molecule that I was talking about is the lecithin that you can extract from soybeans, from uh, egg yolks. And we have here oil, water, and here is lecithin. And then when you try to mix uh, oil and water, you know what happens? They're not gonna mix because they have a, a different molecular structure or composition that calls to have different properties and they don't like to mix with each other. Let's see how it happens. So scientists can do some simulations and we can understand how the molecules uh, can interact with each other. So, these are, are fatty acids, and the small molecules are the water uh, molecules. And they, they have different intermolecular forces, so they don't like to interact with each other. So they basically don't mix. But then when we pour this mixture into the emulsifier, the lecithin,
And then we mix it. The result is an emulsion. And as you can see, it's very, uh, it's very dense, it's thicker. It has different properties. And what is happening is that these uh, molecules of lecithin represented in this uh, red uh, figure, red shape, they hold together oil molecules and water molecules. So they create like a spheres called micelles and uh, is how we can mix oil and water based uh, ingredients. That is so cool. So do you have so, uh, any questions so far? I just wanna ask something, I'm sure you're gonna talk about it anyways, but we have emulsifiers at home, don't we? Yes, all the time, like honey, like mustard, like eggs. So just by mixing eggs and oil and with a little bit of uh, chemistry, you can do mayonnaise. So, uh, and for instance, here is a recipe for a salad dressing. So uh, I would recommend that if you wanna eat some greens, um, just for making a salad dressing, use just lemon juice, um, whole grain, Dijon mustard, olive oil, and honey. And this is the result that you're gonna get. It's gonna be really sweet um, and acidic. So it's gonna be delicious. And let's see how you can make it. So we are uh, here we have Dijon mustard. So only one teaspoon per tablespoon. That's, yes, that's ground Dijon mustard and the other one was whole grain. So the mixture of both will, will be much better for making more stable emulsions. This is just for facilitating the mixture of uh, oil. Martha, we have a question for clarification. Is mustard the emulsifier? Yes, because it has some components on it, some molecules that are similar to the soy lecithin or the egg yolk lecithin. Also, somebody made a comment that is slightly unrelated, but I think it's still related. They said honey can't expire. Yes. Honey is one of those foods that if uh, we don't touch the supermarkets for a hundred years, when we go back into the supermarket, the milk will be bad, the cereal will be bad, the bread will be bad but not the honey. And it's basically because it doesn't have a lot of moisture in it, so it can last longer. Oh, there's an explanation. Thank you, Martha. Yeah, so we can use a uh, whole grain Dijon and ground uh, mustard in order to make these kind of salad dressings. Also, before we make emulsions, um, somebody pointed out that you can take the properties of the water and oil because they don't fit, they don't mix. You can take the water, the oil, and the food coloring, and you can make a homemade lava lamp. Yes. So now I have a question. Um, do you think that... Um, Ice cream is an emulsion, and why? All right, boys and girls uh, and everybody with us today, type that into the chat. Is ice cream an emulsion? Hmm. Um, I know, me and Yuli are really thinking about this. I'm not sure. And I'm going to give you this number that is really surprising. So ice cream is made of 50% of air bubbles. So when you eat ice cream, you're eating air bubbles. 
Does that mean I can have twice as much? (laughs) That's a good one. Okay. (laughs) That logic is flawless, Julia. I think yes. All right, let's see what we've typed. Somebody says uh, we've got um, mostly thinking no. Somebody says uh, they don't think it's an emulsion because it has a lot of moisture in it. I don't know if that's a factor or not. Um, But I also have a question. Are you ready, Martha? Yes, it's an emulsion. And it's an emulsion that is really foamy because it entrains 50% of air bubbles. And it's a mixture of water, so it has a lot of moisture on it. It has fat, so it has these uh, molecules. Um, It also has a lot of proteins from milk, mainly, and it has emulsifiers. And when they mix uh, the proteins in in milk, they entrain uh, the fatty molecules, the fat molecules. So, and in this process, while making uh, ice cream, um, there is a lot of air that is introduced in this mixture. So it's why it looks so foamy and airy and like with a soft consistency. So when you're eating ice cream, you're eating basically 50% of air bubbles. So just that keep in mind. Okay, Martha, so I have a question here. Somebody says that you take the oil, the water, and the emulsifier, you mix them all together, and you get your emulsion out of that. Um, If you could remove the emulsifier, if you could take that molecule out, would the emulsion stay together, or would it immediately separate out again? They will separate, perhaps in a couple of minutes. Uh, If you let the, the emulsifier on it, there are emulsions that can last for years. But the separation of the emulsifier is going to be very difficult uh, because they are mixed together and there are some intermolecular interactions that are very spontaneous. So it's going to be so difficult to separate those molecules. Difficult or impossible? It's not impossible. We do it all the time uh, in the petroleumics group at the MAGLA. So we usually separate um, the emulsifiers uh, from petroleum, uh, from petroleum emulsions, and we can we can look at them with the magnets and we can understand what is the molecular composition. So it's not difficult. It's, it's, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. All right. So we have those... to do we have to use chemistry, advanced you, you chemistry. Heard, you heard it from Martha. It is difficult to pull it out, but not impossible. So keep that in mind when somebody tells you something is difficult, that doesn't mean it's impossible. Uh, Martha, somebody asked about the ice cream, the air bubbles in the ice cream, does that make it bigger than it would be normally? Yes. So that's why it's so creamy, so fluffy. And one more question. They asked if you can make a homemade emulsifier, and I know the answer to that. Can you repeat that again? Yeah, if it's possible for them to make a homemade emulsifier. Yes. Yes, they can do it. They can extract it from something that I think almost every person or many people eat, eat it every day, which is egg. So they can extract emulsifiers from eggs. There you go, everyone. Thanks, Martha. Okay, so and as I told you, by introducing airs into liquids by with the help of an emulsifier, we can make forms. So and for this, uh, soil lecithin is critical. So we can make this kind of foams um, like carrot foam, coffee foam, coconut. Uh, we can also make like vegan mayonnaise, olive oil butter. And um, this is especially done for um, decorating like different dishes or recipes. So let's see how we can make carrot air or foam. Martha, I'm going to need you to come visit me and make some coffee foam for me. And I'll share with Yulia. Thank you. <laughs> so here we have carrot juice. And then we add the soy, uh, the soy lecithin powder. 
So there is a company that sells uh, all these ingredients for molecular gastronomy. I will give you information at the end of the, of the presenta presentation. And then with an immersion blender, what you do is just start introducing air bubbles. And someone may say, okay, air bubbles are gonna be introduced anyways. Yes, you are correct, but uh, the foam is not gonna, uh, like it won't last perhaps, it will last only one or 30 seconds, 30 seconds or one minute. But when you add the um, emulsifier, it can last for hours. And this is just decorating the recipe. It's gonna be a dessert. You can see that that's a chef that's putting a lot of work into this. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's very like detailed in every single step of the decoration process. Yes, so and this is how we can make foam. You can do it with every single liquid that you can imagine. That's impressive. So, and as I told you before, uh, the egg gel also has this molecule. This, this is like the perfect emulsifier. And with this molecule, we can make mayonnaise. So let's see how we can make mayonnaise. This is really easy. When I do it like uh, in our Zoom, uh, before the spill, um, it took me only 30 seconds to produce the mixture. Yeah, this was an activity we did in our um, in our um, summer camp in the summer exploration series. They made mayonnaise at home in the summer of 2020 and 2021. You did it with the side girls, didn't you? Yes. Side girls. So then this is the recipe for making something like this. So here are the egg yolks and a whole egg, salt, some spices, pepper, and then the oil. And then you just use an immersion blender. And you can see how you start mix, mixing the different ingredients. So it takes a different consistency. It changes the color. Uh, it's gonna be more uh, stickier. It looks like heavier, more dense. Um, so it's because emulsions, they have different properties compared to the initial liquids that we mix. And this is where cooking becomes very experimental because you need the egg yolk, you need the oil, and then everything after that is what we add for our the flavors that we want. Even even the 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 oil, it doesn't have to be olive oil or corn oil, right? Martha, it can be whatever oil they want to try. Yes, I have done with avocado oil or coconut oil. So there is another technique called esperification. And with esperification, we can make caviar or spears uh, with any liquid that you can imagine. So for instance, uh, I have made with asparagus juice, with balsamic vinegar, with different uh, fruit juices, with coffee, with kombucha, and even with honey. So, and the process is that we are going to trap fruit juice inside a sphere. And the way we do it, or we create the sphere, is by uh, creating a gel wall 
which is formed from this uh, chemical that is a natural occurring chemical, uh, is really safe, and it's called sodium alginate. And then we're gonna make this uh, sodium alginate to interact with calcium ions, and they are going to do a coordination reaction that will create a sphere. So let's see, this is the molecular representation of that process. This is the alginate change. And this is the, these are the calcium ions. And when they interact with calcium, they create like a wall around the liquid that is what it creates the spheres. So for that process, what we do is we dissolve the alginate into the juice. Then we let the air bubbles going out. Um, it's gonna take perhaps four hours. Then in a separate uh, container, we do a calcium bath, and then we drop this alginate solution into the calcium bath and we create the spheres. So let's see how you can do it. And Martha, this is another activity you did with the side girls this summer, didn't you? Yes. So here we are preparing the juice that we want to create the spheres. So I think it's cranberry juice, and then we mix it with the alginate, which is the naturally occurring gel in agent. So then we uh, put the mixture in a container and let the air bubbles to escape because you know that when we mix liquids in a blender, we introduce air bubbles. So this is a requirement that uh, is, is needed in order to get the experiment to work. And then this is the calcium bath. And you can see that in some cases, the experiment doesn't work. Uh, and it's because again, the pH, the proper, that, that important chemical property is not the, the adequate pH is some, sometimes is really high or really low. And we can solve this issue by uh, adjusting the pH just by mixing citric acid. And when it's solved, um, you can see how by dropping the mixture of the juice and the alginate, you start creating some spheres. And these spheres will stay spheres even when you take them out of the bath. Yes. So cool. And remember, Thanksgiving's next week. So and you can do it, you can do it faster. So we had this at the open house, the caviar maker. And you can produce a lot of uh spheres uh in just one step. I hope somebody makes uh turkey and gravy spheres. Martha, we have a question. Yes. So when you boil water, we get bubbles, of course, but how come sometimes when we boil water, we get some foam on the surface of the water? I think perhaps because the container had some protein residues, <laughs> especially when you have boiled eggs or something like that, there are some like residues of proteins and especially proteins, they, they are they're very uh, especially used to produce foams. That explains a lot of things, actually. So <laughs> there's the answer to the question we got from the chat. Thank you. So there is another technique uh, that is also a verification process, but it's reverse verification. So instead of uh, the liquid that we want to create the sphere, uh, it doesn't contain uh, the alginate. The alginate is going to be in the bath, and the and the liquid that we want to create the sphere with is going to contain the calcium ions. And this is especially uh, um, used for making bigger spheres, like for instance, uh, yogurt ravioli. So let's see how we can make yogurt ravioli. It's really easy. So we have the yogurt. And, um, this is just water, and we're gonna do the alginate bath. So the alginate is 
the gelling agent that causes uh, the production of the uh, wall for creating the spear. Martha, why and is then a... this, the liquid is going to contain the calcium ion. So you dissolve the calcium salt, which is not going to change uh, the flavor of the yogurt. And it's really highly soluble. So it's, very, it's a very easy process. And then you see how you can create the bigger spheres that we call ravioli. So they're not really spheres. No, the no, shape is not perfect. But they're kind of spheres still. Then you just rinse them with water. Wow. Okay, I've got a question, but I think we're about to see the answer to the question. And the question is, are these spheres liquid or solid? They are liquid. So they have the wall, which is solid, is, is like a gel. And then inside there is a the liquid. You see? And in the previous one, I think like if we go back a little bit yes. somebody asked so the edible they are 100 percent edible yes and they are like there are many restaurants that they do molecular gastronomy this kind of separation preparations and just getting a dinner there can be really expensive like more than 500 dollars per per person but you somebody get to taste like eight to 20 different uh, legal preparations. So you get, you get to taste like different uh, techniques of molecular gastronomy. Somebody says that they look like little Hershey kisses. <laughs> oh, you. and somebody here has had them. Lucky. This is definitely the tastiest science night we've had in a while. And one another technique that is really uh, easy to do at home is uh, jellification for making spaghetti or different like uh, different preparations. So we use different gelling agents. Um, the most particular one or important one is agar agar, and it's uh, especially used for making uh, spaghetti. So uh, we can make a spaghetti from uh, different ingredients. This is broccoli spaghetti. So let's see how we can make how we can make this. Um, different shapes. So this is Martha, fruit spaghetti. Martha, as you're showing us this video, somebody asked, what is xanthan gum? Xanthan gum is also a gel in agent that you can use uh, for making like jello, but uh, it has a stronger properties compared to like regular jello. So here we're just making the fruit juice. And then the, the key part of the process, the secret, is that when you meet the agar agar, which is the, the, the magic ingredient, you have to heat it because it's get, it's the chemistry gets activated with heat. Boys and girls, just so you know, if you've ever done those culture dishes where they give you a Petri dish and you rub your finger on it and then you grow the, that's a different type of agar, but it is also agar. for all of our biologists in the crowd. So during the open house, uh, I think it was 2019, we did chocolate spaghetti um, and many people had it. <laughs> so 
So then you just fill the container that you you want, like for instance, because we have we need um, we we want noodles, so we have a container that has this shape. And then we have an ice bath and we wait like for one minute. I have waited for one minute and one minute is enough, at least for chocolate spaghetti. And then you just take it out by uh, introducing air into the container. And that's how you can make uh, different spaghettis using different uh, ingredients such as broccoli, uh, different veggies, uh, fruits, uh, chocolate, So this is chocolate, I think, and this is mango. Oh, wow, that's amazing. And uh, here is just a reference. So you can buy a starter kit um, for making all these recipes um, at Amazon. So they have different like packages, so you can buy the agar agar, the soy lecithe, the two main ingredients for making the caviar, uh, the spirification process, the yogurt ravioli, and you can do experiments at home. And with this, I, I will be happy to take questions. All right, that was super exciting. Um, I guess with the Thanksgiving break coming up and all the cooking, maybe that's a different twist and something fun to do over the holidays. Um, Carlos, do we have any other questions out there? No, Martha's been doing a great job answering the questions as they came in, but I am looking forward to trying to make a different type of cranberry jelly for Thanksgiving this year. So I'm gonna see if I can make a cranberry spaghetti. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, so I also knew somebody who made like hamburgers and then uh, the ketchup was in caviar. So, oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I could also see the cranberries in, in form of the little spheres. That might also be fun. You know, you could really decorate that real nice over the plate. <laughs> All right, maybe um, we see if some more questions come in while we look at the book picks possibly. Stephanie, did you wanna talk about the books? Yeah, so I, every Mac Lab, we usually do a uh, release a book list related to the topic. Um, this time around, our graphics team is still working on that book list for food, but I am going to send it to you, Leah, as soon as I have it, and uh, Mac Lab will post it to their Pinterest, um, so you'll be able to access it that way. But in the meantime, I do want to share, because um, it's some shorter links, on the library's free streaming service called Canopy. We actually have a couple more like food science videos in case you want to learn a little bit more about this or see a couple more things about food related science. Um, and it will be featured on the book list too, but um, it's a free streaming service if you wanted to sign up for that. And then also I just wanted to promote, um, since we're all on food tonight, the library has a gingerbread house competition going right now. So it's, um, we'll take virtual submissions and in-person submissions for our gingerbread competition. And it's an all ages competition. We do have prizes for every age group. So if you're interested in submitting for that, that link, that third link I just posted has more info about that program. I just wanted to put that out there. That is awesome. And yeah, our book picks or Stephanie's book picks end up on our Pinterest page where we have different um, topics. So all our science nights are represented and you all can just click through and we link directly to the library page and you can uh, check out the books and other media from there. So, uh, and uh, I'll see if my family wants to build a gingerbread house. <laughs> yes, please do. We always Debbie, do a lot of fun submissions. I just checked on that and the deadline for that is December 4th, correct? Yes, yes, thank you for Thank you for mentioning that. Oh, no, no, no. I'm also planning on building a house too. So. Yeah, well, you guys better get to building. Me a house. <laughs> And you could also use some of these techniques for decorations, you know? That's right. I like that. Yes. 
So um, since we were advertising already, that brings us to uh, reminding you all that this is the last science night of 2021. We have the next science night coming up in January and we will talk about our mighty MagLab magnets. Um, we're still figuring out if we will meet you all in person or virtually or in a hybrid format. So stay tuned, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to the Educators Club email off the MagLab or um, yeah, check on our website. We'll keep you all posted and we hope to see you all there since it was a lot of fun to have you today and all these other science nights. Um, so we're all excited for uh, 2022, um, where we'll have um, another four science nights um, in collaboration with the library. Um, thank you all so much. Many, many thanks to uh, Martha for uh, providing this wonderful content. Ooh, I've got questions for Martha, so let's not there say goodbye go. yet. Okay, Martha, here you go. Ready? Quick first, does the chocolate pasta taste like chocolate? Yes. Doesn't get any better. The texture than that. is is a little bit tricky. Some people like it, or people they hate it, but it's chocolate. All right, and the next one, could you make cat food caviar? Oh, that's. I think that's difficult because of the consistency. If it's from the solid food, it's going to be very difficult to make it like liquid. But perhaps, I don't know, another like more like liquid like consistency, I don't know, perhaps a soup or something like that, I think it could be possible. So that brings us back to the difficult but not impossible. <laughs> all right. Um, that's all I got for you, Martha. Thank you so much for answering our questions. Julia, was there anything else? Uh, no, I just wanted to pass it to uh, Carlos uh, for <laughs> the closing remarks. All right, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Like we said, we will skip December for the holidays, but we will see you back in January in some way, shape, or form. Um, and this is when I remind everyone that the National Mag Lab is taxpayer funded by the National Science Foundation and the state of Florida, which makes all of you stakeholders in our facility. So thank you for supporting the Mag Lab science. Finally, thing I always say, stay nerdy, stay geeky, and stay true to who you are. Remember, science is an activity for everyone, and I will see you all soon. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye, everyone.